the idea of, am I on the right path? Am I going the right direction? And it can cause fear. It can cause anxiety. It causes worry. It causes all kinds of things. You begin to wonder and you begin to question your faith. And it can almost cripple us. It can almost make us, uh, uh, it can make us doubt uh, who we serve and who we, and who we worship and things like that. Um, and it can keep you in bondage. Uh, I'm going to look at another group of God's people who were held in bondage with some wrong things. Uh, but they were also held in bondage because they were, they were just in a country that they had taken them captive. Uh, we're going to go way on back in the Old Testament to about Exodus 12. Um, the people of God uh, would choose, uh, the people that God would choose for his own had basically been in slavery for about 400 years. They had went from the land, they had went to Egypt, they were oppressed, they had been kicked down, they had knocked They'd been knocked down for so long that lots of them forgot what freedom was. They forgot what hope was. They forgot what peace felt like. Uh, felt like. Uh, they kind of got used to things. Many of them, however, they remembered the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They remembered the God that they, they served. Uh, they remembered Jehovah Jireh. They remembered what God was like to them. And they had prayed for God. There was a group of people that prayed for God to relieve them and to rescue them and to save them and take them out of Egypt and take them back home, give them freedom. Uh, so God sends the most, maybe the most unlikely person ever uh, to free his people. The guy's name was Moses. Uh, back when Moses was a baby, the Pharaoh had made a, the Jews and the land were coming so prevalent and so numerous that they kind of outnumbered the indigenous people there. There were more people, there were more Jews there than Egyptians, and that freaked them out. So the Pharaoh said, oh, pff, population, uh, we'll, we'll control the population. If there's a Jewish boy that's born, throw him in the Nile River. Easy peasy Japanesey. That was his plan. Um, and Moses was one of those Jewish boys that was born into a Jewish, fam a Jewish family that should have been put into the Nile River with the crocodiles. But his little sister came, put him into the uh, Nile. Pharaoh's daughter saw this baby going in there in a little basket of reeds. She grabbed him out of the water. Moses was raised in Pharaoh's house. So here's this Jewish boy raised in Pharaoh's house, understood all the things of, of Egypt, but he still had this Jewish root within him. Moses, uh, Moses had problems. He had anger issues. He had rage. In fact, that rage flew him off into a tyrant where he, he killed somebody who was beaten up on the Jewish people. So he fled Egypt. He was a wanted man. So he's out, he's out in the wilderness. There's a burning bush. God speaks to him and says, dude, you've got to go free my people. Moses says, I can't because I st 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 stutter. And God says, okay, I want to send Aaron with you. And so they both go there. And they, they go there to release, uh, to release the people of Israel. God arms Moses with ten plagues. Every single one of the plagues was meant to kind of slap the face of an Egyptian god. They had a pantheon. They were, they were polytheistic. They had several gods. In fact, when you look at the, the plagues that Moses releases onto Egypt, every single one of them is a direct slap to the face. The first one, he turned the blood, he turned the water into blood from the Nile River. That's because all the Egyptians believed that all their gods received their power from the Nile River. The second one was a, 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 a plague of frogs. Uh, well, there was this one, I can't pronounce it, but it's H-E-Q-T. That was the name of this Egyptian god. There's, there's hieroglyphics up in the pyramids and things, but this god had a frog face. Uh, the next one was a, a uh, plague of, of gnats or flies coming out of the dust. Well, believe it or not, there was actually a, an Egyptian god that dealt with the dust. So every single one of these had to deal with an Egyptian God. Uh, in fact, look at Exodus 12, 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt tonight and kill all the oldest sons and firstborn male animals of all, in all the land of Egypt and execute judgment on all the what of Egypt? All the gods of Egypt. Um, this is weird. Uh, this is the last plague, and he says, I'm going to take all the firstborn from every house, all the firstborn males from every, uh, every house. Do you remember what Pharaoh had done when Moses was a baby? I'm going to slay all the boys. I'm going to slay all those Jewish boys that are being born. So this whole thing has come back. Now God is saying, hey, I saw what you did to all my people out there at the Nile River. This last plague is going to take away your firstborn. I want to show you how it's done. So that was that last plague. And, and all of those were designed to kind of uh, blow smoke in the, the face of the Egyptian gods. Exodus 12, verse 1 through 13. <clears throat> then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, remember, Aaron is his brother. He goes with Moses because he has a stuttering problem. From now on, this month will be the first and the most important of the entire year. Annually, on the tenth day of this month, church say tenth day. On the tenth day of this month, 
announce this to all the people of Israel. Each family is going to go downtown. They're going to buy them a lamb. Or if a family is small, let it share a lamb with another family in the neighborhood. Whether they share, uh, whether they to share, whether to share in this way depends on the size of the families. Once again, God's not tied up on those details. He's saying, "I want your obedience." This animal shall be a year old male. It'll either be a sheep or a goat. It'll be perfect. It'll be without any blemish. On the evening of the what day? So you buy it on the tenth. And four days later, this little lamb, this little goat you brought into your house, all of these lambs will be killed. Now, the weird thing is, in the original text, it actually gives the time that the animals, that the, that the lambs or goats are killed. It's 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Do not think for one moment that it's a coincidence that our Savior, Jesus Christ, died on the cross on 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Because the Bible says he is our Passover lamb. We're going to talk about more of that in a minute. Can you imagine taking your family down to the market on the 10th? And when you're picking out your lamb or the goat, I guarantee you this is what you're looking for. I want the cutest one. I want the sweetest one. I want the one that will come up on my lap. It won't snap at my kids or my grandkids. I want that one right over there. So they pick out the most cutest lamb or goat and they bring it home on the 10th of the month. And for four days, that little lamb and that goat's walking out of the house and sitting on your lap drinking coffee in the morning. You're stroking it. You're loving that thing. The kids can't wait to get home from, from uh, Torah school to play with that thing. Most precious thing you ever seen. Verse 7. And that lamb's blood will be placed on the two side frames of the door of every home and on the panel above the door. So the left panel, the right panel, and then the, the panel on top. So little lamb chop, that little lamb that had been with your family for the last four days. You have to go take that little lamb out, that little goat out that you've loved, you fed, you watered, you cared for. Imagine explaining that to your kids or your grandkids. Most precious little thing you ever saw. Now that bright red thick blood is now painted over the door, the front porch. It's dripping on the ground. And that blood is a picture that points to the shed blood of Jesus. In Exodus 12, the blood was applied so the people would not have the curse of when the death angel rolled over, their son, their family would remain whole. When we look at Jesus, when the blood poured down, the crimson blood of Jesus on the cross, we too are freed from the curse of sin. We too are freed from the curse of damnation. You and I are saved by the forgiveness of found in the blood of Jesus. We know Jesus' blood on the cross is what sets us free from the bondage of sin. The blood of the Lamb of God was applied to the mercy seat of God. And if I was sitting where you were, I'd be thinking, okay, what, 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 what the heck is the mercy seat of God? Well, y'all, God hates sin. He's a perfect God. He's a just God. There ain't one bit of bad in Him. And when sin comes into the picture, it upsets Him. It makes Him furious. It makes Him angry. God must, and God is just and must punish sin so how does that happen through blood that's what the thing with the lambs and the goats were through blood but here's the thing those are the animals blood there was only one lamb that could take away the sin of the entire world not on an annual basis but a one and done that took place in jerusalem two thousand years ago when jesus the lamb of god shed his blood and his blood was applied to the wrath of god the, the, uh, the, the judgment of God on sin. It was applied to the mercy seat. Which means now we are forgiven. That blood covers us. John 3.16 says this. For God so loved the world. He loved it so much that He gave His one and only Son. That whoever believes in Him will never perish. But they'll have everlasting life. Ephesians 2.13. But now you belong to Christ Jesus. You didn't used to be. But now you do. And though you once were far away from God. Now you've been... Now you've been brought very near to Him, and there's a secret that's brought you near. There's only one thing that brought you near. There's only one road that took you there. And the Bible says, because of what Jesus Christ has done for you with His blood. That's it. His blood's been applied to our hearts. The people, when they went to the, uh, on the tent to buy the lamb and the goat, they were showing obedience. They say, hey, this is what God said. I don't understand it. We've never done this before. This is, a, this is a new thing for us. They'll spend four days with that thing, that lamb, and at, three, at three, uh, 3 p.m. on the 14th, that sacrifice was made. That, that sacrifice is 
made and that blood is spilled. I want to read a little bit further in that. It just wasn't that they, they just didn't drain the blood of this thing, of the lamb or the goat. They just didn't drain the blood and use the blood. Verse 7, use the blood of the lamb eaten in that home. Everyone shall eat roast lamb that night with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. The meat must not be eaten raw, can't be eaten boiled, but it's got to be eaten roasted, including the head, the legs, and the heart and the liver. You and me probably won't fight over the heart and liver, will we? But I want you to know something that's important. Don't eat any of it the next day. If all of it's not eaten that night, be respectful of it and burn what's left. Eat it with your traveling clothes on, prepared for a long journey, wearing your walking shoes and carrying your walking sticks in your hands. Eat it hurriedly. The observance shall be called the Lord's Passover. They would eat this lamb. They would eat it all from head to, to tail. You had to roast it. It couldn't be boiled. You couldn't eat it raw. You had to eat all of it, all the innards and all those things. Preach, why is that in there? Here's the deal. They had to take all the lamb. They couldn't leave any of it. Every part of it they had to use. Church, when you receive the Lamb of God, you do not take Jesus as a good philosopher, but don't take Him as a Savior. You can't take Jesus as a good teacher, but not understand that He's also the Redeemer of the world. You can't take him as a great educator or a great moral person or somebody who had it all figured out with also, uh, without saying he's the son of God. He's the only way to salvation. Hey, when you come to Jesus, you don't just look at the philosophy and the revolutionary ideas and the things the man said. Understand, he's all of those things, but he's also the son of God. He's the redeemer of the world. You don't take part of him. You don't take pa a, part, a part or half. You take him all. He's the Lamb of God, slain since before the foundation of the world. There was only one lamb for everybody. You read that in the text. One lamb was bought for that house. If it was a, if it was a small house, and share with your neighbor. So everybody, everybody had to bring the lamb into their house. Now I want you to look at that verse 8 because there's one word in there to me that's significant. The word is everyone. There was one lamb for everybody. But everybody had to decide what they, were going to do, what they were going to do with the lamb for themselves. It wasn't just enough to bring the lamb in the house. It wasn't just enough to go out and buy the lamb. It wasn't just enough to go through the ritual. Everyone had to take the lamb for themselves. Church, four days, eating of its flesh, consuming it, its strength and its entirety. You had to take the lamb for yourself, all of it. Gee. Listen to me. Jesus is the Redeemer of the world, the Savior of the world, the Lamb of God who comes to remove the sin of the world. But you have to decide what you do with the Lamb yourself. That decision's up to you. What will you do with the Lamb? God was going to ride over the nation and He was going to make a difference in between people. Brother Mike, I didn't think God made a difference in people, between people. Not everybody's going to heaven. Okay? Not everybody's going. Those aren't my words. Those are His words. God doesn't treat us all the same. He says, on that night, I'm going to come over and I'm going to, I'm going to look. Some would live and some would die that night. Some would be grateful and some would be crying on that night. Some would be saved and some would be lost on that night. Some would be protected and some would be destroyed on that night. What was the dependent one thing? What was the reason some would be crying and some would be laughing? What's the one thing? Were they good people? Was it because they were from the land of Egypt or from the land of Israel? I don't think that had anything to do with it. When he went looking for who would live and die, who would be protected and destroyed, there was one thing that made all the difference. Verse 13. The thing that made the difference was the blood you've placed on the doorpost will be proof you obey me. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and I will not destroy your firstborn, but I'm going to smite the fire out of the land of Egypt. Oh, man, some of y'all go get some freedom right now, I promise you. You ready? 
when God flew over those houses, I want you to notice what He doesn't say. He doesn't say, when I pass over and I see that you're good people who put the blood on there, I'll pass over. He doesn't say that. Once I pass over and I'm see, I see that you're serious about your commitment, you're serious about your confession, and you got the blood on the door, I'm going to pass over. He don't say that either. When I pass over and I see you're being a good Jew and you got the blood on the door, I'm just going to keep on going. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, I'm going to pass over, and if you're going to Sunday school, you're good. He doesn't pass over and say, well, if you're tithing, it's all good. If you're reading your Bible and you're praying, I'm going to pass over, you're going to be good. God didn't say none of that. This is cool. He says, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you and I will not destroy you. God's not looking to see if you're good enough to be saved. He's not looking to see if we're good enough to be redeemed. Let me ask you, let me answer that question for you. We're not good enough to be saved. We're not good enough to be redeemed. You or me. We're not. So when we ask the question, am I good enough for God to love me? No. Am I, am I worthy for God to love me? Absolutely not. But here's the thing, y'all. He ain't looking to see if you're worthy. He ain't looking to see if you're good. He ain't looking to see if you've been to church or Sunday school, you're tithing, you're reading your Bible, you're praying. By the way, there's nothing wrong with those things. You need to do them. But I'm going to tell you what he's looking for. He's looking for the blood. He's looking just for the blood. Oh, I got to be good enough. I got to get my life in check before I come to Jesus. Where did you find that at? Oh, as soon as I get my life right, I'm going to go to church. Who told you that? He's not looking to see if you've dotted every I and crossed every T. He's looking to see if the blood's on you. Preach, you sure? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. That's what I'm banking on. If there's another way, I don't know what it is. I'm a true believer, man. Ain't nothing can change my mind from this. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. It's not, how we li- it's not how good we are. It's about the blood of Jesus. And here's the amazing thing. There is no sin too embarrassing, too dark, too secret, too depraved that the blood of Jesus cannot cleanse. None. In fact, the Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us. And this is important. It doesn't say He cleanses us from sin. It says He cleanses us from all sin. All? Yep means everything. Well, Brother Mike, I ain't good. Well, join the club. None of us are. But ain't that blood good? Ain't that blood powerful? The lamb was brought to that house, and it means that if that lamb was brought to the house and everybody trusted that lamb and the blood of the lamb, means everybody's going to be saved. That lamb was the reason why the house was saved. Now, the question I ask you is this, and you don't have to answer it out loud, but I want you to answer it in your spirit. Is Jesus the only blood that saves us? Look at this. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes through the Father. Black, white, fat, thin, rich, poor, smart, silly. No one comes through the Father except through. Is Jesus the only way we're saved? Let's look at Acts 4. Uh, Acts 4.12, and there is salvation in no one else. There is in no other name under heaven given among men by which we're saved. And by the way, that name is Jesus. Is Jesus the only way to be saved? Romans 10.9, because if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Is Jesus the only way to be saved? John 3.36 says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but they're going to see the wrath of God Remains in them. Is Jesus the only way to be saved? Well, look at 1 Timothy 2 5. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men. The man has a name. His name is Jesus Christ. Is Jesus the only way to be saved? 1 Timothy 2 5. I already said, for there is one, I've already said that. Uh, John 17 3. And this is eternal life that we know that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. All right, I could give you more verses, but I'm not. But I want you to settle this. Is Jesus the only way to be saved? If there's another way, it's not in the book. Uh, you know what? There is another way to be saved. You've got to live a perfect life. 
You can never sin. How y'all doing on that? So if you can't live a perfect life, you need Jesus. And here's the thing. He knows we're messed up. He knows we're imperfect. He says, I'm looking for the blood, man. Not if you're worthy. There's one lamb for everybody, but everybody had to decide to take the lamb for themselves. I've introduced Jesus to you today. I've introduced the scripture. Jesus says, no one come to the Father except through me. No other name given under heaven by which men are saved. Jesus is the way. I believe that with all my heart. There's only one lamb. There's only one answer. He's the answer today, here. He's the answer in China. He's the answer in Russia. He's the answer in California. He's the answer in New York. There's one. His name is Jesus. No other way. It's His blood. You have to take the lamb for yourself. I can't do it for you. Pam can't do it for you. Your mom and dad can't do it for you. Your mama and papa can't do it for you. You have to do it. And you got to believe. Have faith that he's the only one to be saved. He's the only one who can redeem me. He's the only one who can forgive my sins. I will tell you this, y'all. If you're counting on being good, or counting on being righteous, or kind, you're counting on because I'm a nice person, or I'm a kind person, God will let me in heaven. God will, God will let me in. No. No, he won't. He only lets those in that are covered in the blood. He looks for the Son's blood on you and me. Well, Brother Mike, you don't know what I've done. He does. And he's got blood for you. Are you counting on being good, righteous, nice, or kind? Or are you only counting on Jesus? Because Jesus is the only hope you and I have. There's nothing good in me or you besides him. I'll close. I think for the last many, many years, we've always taken a vacation down south along the beach. You ever try to walk a straight line on a beach? I mean, even sober, it looks like you've been, you know, it's crazy. I did that one day uh, out on the beach. I was looking down the the coast, and I I thought, I'm going to try to walk a straight line. And I look way down the motel, and I, I use that as my benchmark. And I find an umbrella about, you know, halfway between me and that hotel. So I'm at like, a, like, a, like a rifle. I'm trying to aim everything up. And I don't really want to try this. It was a slow vacation. There wasn't a lot to do, okay? I'm a very simple man. <laughs> I'm easy. I walked about a quarter of a mile, maybe a half a mile. I was winded. It was a long walk. Uh, <laughs> but I look back, and it's like... Ray Charles had walked out there, you know. No matter how hard I tried to walk a straight line, I couldn't do it. My footprints were cro- crooked. My path was, was hair-lipped. I went that way, and I got distracted, you know, and I walked over here. I, 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 I tried my best, but, man, my path was crooked, hair-lipped, wasn't straight at all, and I gave it my best shot. The Lord began to speak to me. He said, Mike, whatever you try to do in your own strength and in your own power will always be crooked. You can't even walk a straight line. I went back into the house, and the Lord talks to me like that, and I hope he talks to you that way. I'm sitting up there drinking my uh, Arnold Palmer, watching all this, and I'm beating myself up. God's, God's wearing me out. I go to bed that night. I wake up the next morning. I thought, surely to God, I couldn't have walked that crooked. I go out the next day. Can I tell you what happened to me, Nikki? While I was asleep, the tide had come in. And all my tracks, all my crooked paths, all my detours, all my missteps were gone. He said, Mike, I told you what I told you last night because I want you to know today every misstep you've ever taken, I have removed. Church, that's what the blood does for you and me. 
every misstep, every wrong path, every detour, every distraction. The blood covers. Friend, you might, here be, you might be here today and, and maybe you're counting on the blood of your good works. It's not good enough. You're counting on the blood of, of your church attendance. It ain't good enough. I've been faithful to my wife my whole life. I've been faithful to my husband my whole life. I've kept my marriage vows. That is not what gets you to glory. What are you going to do with the lamb? What are you going to do with the lamb? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Today, if you've never given your heart to Jesus, this is your time. Say, hey, Brother Mike, I want to shore this thing up. I want to know for sure if this is my last day on this ball. I want to make sure that me and God are good. Good for you. Praise the Lord. Let me help you out with that. Let's invite Jesus into our hearts this morning. Let's claim the blood for our own forgiveness. Just pray with me. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need you. I need forgiveness. I need healing, I need salvation, I need hope. And I know that you're the Lamb of God, the Son, <laughs> the Son of God, <coughs> to come to take away the sins of the world. Jesus, take away my sin. <coughs> take away my sin, Lord. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Holy Spirit, fill me. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, God bless you. Thank you if you said that prayer today for the first time. If you invited Jesus into your heart today, this is your day. September 22nd, 2024. You just had your moment with God and your sins have been released, have been forgiven, have been blotted out. If that's the first time you said that prayer, would you just lift your hand up? And put it right back down. Praise the Lord. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let me talk to the rest of you. Brother, sister, is there a sin in your life that you think, I'm saved, I'm born again, I'm washed in the blood, but I cheated on my wife a long time ago, and I, I hope God forgives that. Or maybe you're saying, I cheated on my husband a long time ago. I hope God forgives that. Or I did something at work that I shouldn't have done. Or I did something at school that I'm ashamed of. Or, or whatever. But it's something in your past that has just consumed you. Eating you alive. I've got a message from the Word of God for you today. If it's been under the blood, it's been dealt with. If it's under the blood, it's been dealt with. What do you need to bring under the blood this morning? What do you need to let go? He's already forgiven it. What do you need to let go? What do you need to stop beating yourself up over so you can walk into your newness of life and freedom? I'm going to ask you if you would to stand to your feet, please, with your heads bowed and your eyes are closed. <coughs> As Pam continues to play with every head bowed, every eye closed, this morning, if you, if you would want to take some time to just simply come up to this altar and, and just pour your heart out to God, you can, you can stand, you can kneel, it doesn't matter. But just say, God, I've been having this in my life for a very long time. Or, or Lord, I've wrestled with this and I didn't think you could forgive it. But I, didn't think you could, I didn't think you could do anything with it. I'm scared because it's, it's still in my mind. I, I don't know if it's really forgiven or not. Y'all, he's looking for the blood. He ain't looking to see how hard you're trying. He ain't looking to see any of that. And those things are important, but y'all, let's put the blood first. Then let's work on that stuff. Bring your, bring your struggle. Bring your pain. Bring your regret. Bring your hurt under the blood this morning. Almighty God, in the name of Jesus, as we go into this invitation, I pray for those who are going to come to the altar. I pray for those who are going to download some pain in their, their hearts this morning. They're just going to give it to you. Father, we pray for freedom this morning. 
And I ask this in your precious and holy name. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Would you come this morning? Every head bowed, every eye closed.